We will be in a zero-sum world if we can't grow and increase productivity. The war is fought in Ukraine and I feel like we are not included at all. And today's politics is the personalization of politics. Ukrainians, Russians, Americans, British, and fill in the blank. They all have a responsibility. There was an attempt to commit to truth-seeking and impartiality and objectivity. Today, that is simply no longer the case. There is no correlation between happiness and earnings. We know that. Governments, as I said before, drop the ball. It becomes increasingly unequal because that's what human beings do. What do you think, in the current circumstances, uh, should be done to advance peace in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Are you saying that the, uh, uh, the West should not be supporting Ukraine at all? There should be no weapons provided to Ukraine? What do you think should be actually done? Well, we had two conflicting interests there. We had the anxiety of the West about what the Russians might do, and we had the anxiety of the Russians about what the West was likely to do. They had been maneuvering against one another, as was correctly said earlier, for many years, militarily in the Donbass, in the area nearest the Russian border, and politically and otherwise, in all the usual intelligence as well, maneuvering that we know goes on. So the issue for me, and I think a reasonable way to approach it, is to say, before you get to the point of the threat of the basic interests of these two sides, that you sit down, which was done early in the conflict back in February, to try to come up with some solution that might address the needs of both sides so there is no war, rather than proceed crossing each other you know, red lines, as they like to call them, and then pro one side provokes the other. And then to retreat into saying who exactly provoked who, when, with what date, uh, really, that's childish. The issue is what are the fundamental concerns, and those have to be put on the table with a demand that they be worked out without military recourse. Okay, I I'm still, I'm afraid, not quite sure whether you think that there should be in the, in the interim of coming to an agreement, a, a, a diplomatic agreement with Russia, you think there should be support for Ukraine. But let's turn to Svetlana. What, what do you think about that uh, diplomatic, as it were, solution to peace? Uh, first of all, Russia, even now, they don't want to negotiate. And they repeated a lot of times that they're, go they're going to have peace talks only on their terms, meaning that uh, the occupied parts of Ukraine that are right, are right now under Russian control, that we, they will remain Russian, that Ukraine will have to give up Crimea, east of Ukraine, the Parisian region, but not only that, that Ukraine should never become a NATO member, and all of the other demands that Russia has. And when uh, we are talking about the negotiations between the West and Russia, I don't see their Ukraine, I mean, the war is fought in Ukraine, and I feel like we are not included at all. Like, it, it sounds like everything has to be decided over us, that they will reach some kind of agreement, and but what will happen to Ukrainian people who are living in <coughs> occupation, who are scared to leave their houses because their women can be raped, that the kids that can't learn their language, what happened to all of those people if those lands remained Russian? So my answer for that is, Ukraine has to receive uh, the military and financial support to win the war in a military way. If it is not enough uh, to win the war, if we receive not enough like now, Ukraine at least have to be in the better position before negotiations. It has to have certain leverage to talk with Russia. For example, if we receive long-range missiles and we uh, seize Russian army in Crimea, and uh, destroy the care bridge, then we can talk with Russia about something or we destroy their fleet. Because right now, both sides won't ne negotiate because Russia, of course, won't leave Ukraine's lands 
and Ukraine won't give up its territories and its people. So, Richard, you, you're, you're not taking into account the interests of the Ukrainians in suggesting a negotiation between uh, the West and Russia. Of course I am. That, that's the kind of debate that it goes nowhere, finger-pointing, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. It's childish. Of course Ukraine's interest is in my mind. The horror of the war that is being fought mostly on their territory is self-evident. They are suffering unspeakably, and they should not have. And the responsibility for that is largely distributed all across the participants, Ukrainians, Russians, Americans, British, and fill in the blank. They all have a responsibility, all of them, to participate in a negotiated settlement that takes into account the, the needs, the genuine needs of the Ukrainian people, the Russian people, and the Western countries that have inserted themselves into this arrangement. Well, they may, they may all have a responsibility, but Svetlana's point is that the Russians aren't going to take that responsibility. They're, they're not going to take into account the interests of the Ukrainians. And what do you do? What do you propose? that you do in a situation where one party is simply not prepared to take into account the interests of the other. Well, we don't read the history the same. The Russians feel that they have not had their security interests taken seriously by the NATO powers, by the United States and Britain that guaranteed them certain protections with the end of the Cold War, etc. I'm not here to negotiate or to arbitrate among these different perspectives. But I don't think it gets us one step closer to peace to spend our time deciding who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. This stuff happens in every war. And mostly what it does is obscure the underlying productions of this. Why did NATO move to the east? Why was that a useful thing to do in the interests of world peace? That's just as important as what happened in the Donbass over the last eight years. All of those things are reflections of underlying social processes. Obviously, you've been privy to some of the characters that we see on the news. You've spoken to world leaders. You've, you've, you've seen how these people think sometimes firsthand. Um, yeah. What, what are some of the most valuable lessons that you've personally gained from those interactions? Well, I mean, sometimes they're very cautionary tales because, right. you know, you really kind of see the limits um, and, uh, many of our leaders, you know, today. I mean, I've seen some pretty inspirational, you know, people as well at first hand. But, you know, there's only so much one individual can do. And I think, that, you know, the biggest risks that we have in today's politics is the personalization of politics. Right. And we see the strongman phenomenon you know, on every frontier. I mean, lots of books being, you know, written about this, you know, for example, and it's it's a feature of our time. Because, you know, when you have a time of rapid change, people really can't keep up and they're kind of looking for some mechanism to say, stop the world, I want to get off, or stop the world, I don't want it to change anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's very easy for individuals to um, uh, come forward in that regard and present themselves as champions, you know, the populist leader. But, you know, they're very limited. And so, I mean, the things that I've learned the most is just this importance of having checks and balances in the system and also, to be honest, the, the power of people power. I mean, we've, we've all got ourselves to, you know, be instead of followers, be more uh, active um, and, you know, think about actions that we can take. And, you know, what uh, the best leaders are those who actually listen to other people and really take their advice on board. But we also have to, again, understand the limitations of the political systems that we're in. People are always blaming, you know, the US for this or, you know, the UK for that. And, you know, our systems themselves are quite limited in the information that gets brought forward. I mean, it's extraordinarily important to try to find, you know, again, mechanisms of openness so that information comes in. Because you're only as good as the things that you know. And, you know, the advice that you can, uh, you can take on board. Uh, you know, and I've, again, I've learned, you know, how important it is to have good analysis, to have objective analysis, you know, to basically bring that forward to, to help people uh, make decisions. But there is also then, you know, the importance of speaking out when things take you know, pretty, a turn. Uh, pretty negative turn. Yeah. But, you know, uh, this is a moment where all of our politics, you know, kind of across the world are, are really jeopardized by this kind of idea that strongmen, populist politicians can really resolve things. And really, really what we do, we do need is more kind of grassroots action and figuring out 
other ways of giving people you know stakes uh, stakes in the system and i mean I've, I've taken all that away from you know being on the inside and seeing really the limitations right but i've also seen you know how much things can be done by small numbers of dedicated people you know have a shared sense of mission and of yeah. responsibility yeah so i would also you know kind of um uh, make an appeal for you know thinking more positively about public service and civil service of you know all kinds of uh, a different uh, a different levels because again you know governance is only as good as the people who get involved in it yeah i want to say something to martin's observation about the zero sum world and the politics which i think identifies maybe the central political challenge for the rest of this century and when one talks about a zero sum world in the absence of new gains in productivity one is measuring the sum in terms of money, in terms of GDP measured by dollars. And as long as GDP is measured in that way and the sum is measured in that way, we will be in a zero-sum world if we can't grow and increase productivity. And the politics will be extremely dark for all the reasons that Martin identifies. Uh, at the same time, there are other ways to think about the total or aggregate well-being of a civilization. And before 1800, no civilization would have thought of its well-being in terms of GDP. And there are ways to lead a positive sum world, even without increasing GDP, if we measure the sums by human flourishing, by connections, by the, the substantive well-being of the civilization that we manage to produce. The difficulty is, you know, if wishes were horses, then beggars would ride. And the, the zero-sum view, the GDP view, is the product of two centuries of intellectual work, of institution building, and of enormously morally and politically potent cultural development. And identifying that it will become a problem once growth stops is not the same thing as constructing the imaginative alternative that we will need to survive that problem. Uh, my view is one of the great tasks of intellectuals of the moment is to start working towards that alternative. But to be responsible in that, one has to acknowledge both the enormous moral achievement of the market-based view and the fact that we are still living in it and wishing we weren't won't get us out of it and denying its accomplishments won't make us help us to see the problems that need to be solved as we do get out of it. Okay, so, so sorry, Martin. This is really, really important because I think, and it's probably a point, we need disagreement. So this is, uh, because this is an incredibly important issue. I agree completely about the way we frame GDP, and that, but I won't go into that. So in the, all the many centuries before anybody invented GDP, um, what was society like? And I would say it behaved exactly as one would expect uh, a society with very, very limited wealth and a very limited number of people who controlled the wealth kings and aristocrats with a few others to behave. They didn't need to know GDP. They knew they wanted everything. And the, so one of the most fascinating pieces of historical research, and this is increasingly now empirically supported, is the, the organized societies, and I'm not talking, you know, so large states and so forth, in the pre-modern period were as unequal as they could be. That is to say, 80 to 90% of the population, uh, the people um, Dan was talking about, lived on the more margin of survival, and most of them were agricultural laborers. All their surplus was extracted by the top. That was the ultimate zero-sum society, and it became maximally unequal. So my concern, my concern is when we go, since I'm a pessimist, when we go to our new zero-sum society, and I think we've been moving for it towards it over the last 30 or 40 years, it becomes increasingly unequal because that's what human beings do. And the extractive regime at the top, and there are many examples of this, becomes the dominant mode. So while I would like to believe you know, in the, in the 
this glorious moral revolution, I am deeply concerned that as we become more static, we go back to the zero sumness of the 17th, 16th, 15th century or ancient China, one of the most extreme examples in history. And that really is something we have to think about. So, so this is extremely important and we agree in some ways and disagree in others. Um, here's where we agree. One of the things that the productivity revolution and the market societies that produced it have achieved is to corral the process of getting for me into a form that has some positive product for others, as opposed to the prior ways of doing this, which were purely extractive, self-interested, and exploitative, and therefore very damaging. So I think we agree about that. Um, the place where we might disagree, and I don't know how deeply, uh, you know, it's a little bit it's, it's old Hegel, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The future cannot be a return to the past for all the reasons Martin identifies and a thousand others also, including that moral pluralism has let a certain cat out of the bag that the past controlled by suppressing. But at the same time, I don't think we should be trapped in the tyranny of no alternatives and think that the way in which people were before 1800 is the way in which we naturally or inevitably are. Uh, the way in which people naturally are is probably the way in which they ordinarily are. That is to say, we're enormously malleable by our social circumstances. And uh, it is a hopeful thing to say that we can create social circumstances that will shape us in a way that manage to retain the gains for cohesion and other regardingness of the productivity revolution while discarding what are now the costs. There's no certainty that we can do that, but we have no alternative but to work in that direction because the alternative is environmental calamity and collapse for all of us. Let me, let me pick up on one or two things you said there with, with, with Yanis on that, because I mean, we're criticizing central bankers. You, you three seem to be pretty uh, unanimous on that. But is it that they are the wrong people or they have a job that is not possible? They are not uh, able to do it because it's, it's not a job that can be done yet. Well, the, the constraints that they're facing, they made a very huge error in the 2000s, before 2008, not to pick up on the massive private money that was being minted. It was not just that they were lending money to people. They were borrowing money from themselves in order to purchase the very toxic derivatives that they were buying, derivatives that started becoming money and effectively increasing the money supply. So that was that's where the central banks dropped the ball in mm -hmm. the 2000s. After 2008, though, I have sympathy with them because, you know, uh, it, it was, they were the only game in town. Governments, as I said before, dropped the ball. They, they, they went into austerity at the time of a massive recession, uh, and the central bankers were constrained on what to do with the money tree. So they plucked the money tree, but the only thing they could do was to, to buy debt, private debt and public debt, which was never going to be plowed into investment in order to expand the supply for the time when we need it. And John, look, the, the, the problem was not inflation. We had years of money printing that was failing inflation. to arrest inflation. Mm -hmm. The reason why we had the inflation with the supply chain interruption due to the pandemic was because we had 10 years of no investment in the supply side of the economy due to the inability of the central bank to do that. Which I think a lot of them would want to do, which to, which to pluck the money tree, not to invest in productive capacity, well, not to buy me... McDonald's bonds, right, as they were forced to do, right? So that, right. That, that's, that's the main issue. And what happened with the pandemic, of course, was that some of the money had to be given to the little people. At the time when, when supply chains were disrupted, that went up, and that's when they lost control of it. They should have been given the opportunity by government, by parliament, John, right, to work together with a public investment vehicle and private investment vehicle to channel this created money into the things that would have expanded the supply of green energy so as to be able to lessen our dependence here in Europe <laughs> to yeah. the European... To, to, I, mean, I, I agree there was too much austerity over the previous decade, but I don't accept your, your explanation of, of why the, the monetary policy went wrong. I mean, what, what happened was uh, the QE was not inflationary because at the same time that they injected a lot of QE and mainly by the state bond market, as you say, uh, the regulators, sometimes the central bank, sometimes independent regulators, were ratcheting down the amount of credit that commercial banks could lend on, on the basis of the cash that was in circulation. And because they wanted a much higher cash ratio for the commercial banks to make them more prudent, 
and recover their balance sheets, it was safe from the inflationary point of view to put that QE out there as some kind of counterbalance. Indeed, if they hadn't put, put enough QE out there in, in the middle of the crisis, we'd have had many more bankrupt banks and an even deeper yeah, and longer that, recession. That, just that, that, recently, yeah, the Federal just... Reserve Board had to inject um, 400 billion, I think it was, when the regional banks started to pop because money type policy is so tight. The universities in this country have completely given up on any pretense to be objective, independent, impartial institutions. Okay, and if you disagree with that, give me one day and I'll give you a tour of universities and show you what I mean. They've become openly political organizations, and in some ways that's how they started. They started as very religious institutions that were pushing an agenda, but in the mid 20th century, late 20th century, there was an attempt to commit to truth seeking and impartiality and objectivity. Today, that is simply no longer the case. Ideological litmus tests are used across the board if you want to get research grants, if you want to get jobs, if you want to get promoted. If you challenge the liberal consensus, if you challenge things like gender identity theory, opposition to Brexit, particular interpretations of British history, uh, you basically will experience some form of indirect or direct discrimination. And if you want the evidence of that, there's a lovely book in the tent over there called Values, Voice and Virtue, which will present all of the evidence to you. And the reason I point to that is because in a way it's reflective of what's happening in other aspects of our national life. Um, for those who do challenge this narrow orthodoxy within our um, public square that is basically anti-Brexit, pro-globalization, pro-migration, socially liberal, um, which basically speaks to about 20% of the country. If you look at the British Social Attitude Survey, uh, the latest edition came out last week, it suggests that 20% of Britain are strongly and consistently socially liberal on a whole range of issues. If you challenge some of those assumptions, some of those beliefs, um, you are variously told that you are buying into misinformation, that you are um, pursuing half-truths or you have been manipulated by media and so on and so forth, to the point where even fact-checkers and reality checks and so on, if you look at them closely, are basically becoming openly partisan, is what I would argue. Matt, can I right? ask you a can question? I, can I just, 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 so if you, if you challenge this consensus, you will find yourself... Um, essentially being gaslit by many institutions. So if you ask yourself the question, why are so many people rebelling politically, culturally, socially, it is because when they look at these institutions, they do not see people like them who reflect their worldview. What can we do about it? We can, we can force open the institutions. We can actually have people in those institutions who do represent a wider diversity of viewpoints. That might make you feel uncomfortable, but if you genuinely want to reduce polarization in society, you know, we're going to have to do that. And I think that's the great, the true, the true power, which is you've got a system which using the profit incentive rewards people for innovation, rewards people for creating things. Um, profit is the reward you get for um, creating a good whose parts is equal, uh, it becomes, you've made together is equal more than the cost of it made to produce. So I think that the, the profit motive in the market system has delivered these, these innovations that have made things like an iPhone in my pocket with extraordinary ca um, technological capacity accessible to the masses. So in any meaningful sense, the, if you look at the amount of food you can have or travel you could do today, that would have been a few hundred years ago unimaginable for the 99% of people. Even potentially Rockefeller wouldn't have had the kind of luxuries that, that it just basically everyday things Well, today. the iPhone didn't exist. So. Well, indeed, that's the point, which is the, the, the capitalist system has given us these great innovations. And this is actually where I get confused by Aaron's whole philosophy, be, be, because he talks about luxury communism, but in fact, everything that he seems to love has come out of a capitalistic system. It's come out of the innovations that have been driven by a market funded, system. Funded by the basically the US taxpayer. But Everything in the iPhone comes out. No, that's true. Th that is completely nonsense. No, that is completely oh, There are a few specific fact. patents that can be linked back to some no, specific HTML, technologies. Touch screens, lithium batteries, no, no, no. microprocessors. But we are not going to make this about the iPhone. So um, <laughs> no, we, no, you can pick this up all afterwards all by all means. No, um, I do want to give Aaron a chance to come back on this question of inequality. But you mentioned 
inequality for wrong reasons? What's inequality for right reasons? If it's inequality between people who put in different effort, between an entrepreneur, someone who creates something, you know, there's, there's a, a doctor who's working 20 hour days saving people's lives, you know, people aren't, I don't think we should expect everyone to have the same incomes and the, and the same wealth precisely. Um, there are, there are, that, that, that scene would be kind of dystopian outcome to me. So and a cleaner working 20 hours shouldn't be paid the same as a doctor working 20 hours? Well, I, I mean, I think, the, the, it's not to say the amount of work you do, but the value of the work and the value of what you create is, is you know, in some way not perfectly representative of your income. Um, but a doctor's obviously spent an extremely long period of time and is doing a, a very um, life, you know, saving, uh, life-threatening job. So, uh, I mean, a footballer, people get a lot of value out of it. You know, I wouldn't pay a footballer £20 million, but I think they get a lot of value out of, uh, clearly football um, viewers get a lot of value out of that. Um, Aaron, I want to ask you about inequality. Is inequality legitimate and what role, sh what place should it have within the systems that you're promoting, advocating for? Mm. It's a great question. Inequality in and of itself, I, I agree to an extent, it can be something of a, a, a pointless obsession. Clearly, if everybody was earning £60,000 a year, and we know empirically that after £60,000 a year earnings, there is no correlation between happiness and earnings. We know that. So you could get to a point, and let's not talk about what that would do to inflation. And let's just sort of say, speculatively, everybody could earn 60 grand a year. Then, yeah, I can, I can see conditions under which you say, fine, you can have a certain amount of inequality. But the conditions we live under at the moment are rather different to that. So in the United States, for instance, you have around 40 million people that need food stamps to eat, right? And I, I, I think that is unacceptable. And I'm not going to just deploy a, a moral argument around that. I also sort of deploy a political theoretical argument. So it's two strange words put together, but political theory. And I would say to people who are liberals, because people who are liberals say, the individual is uniquely placed to determine their own life. Nobody else. Not you Marxists with the state to tell them. I agree that the individual is uniquely placed to determine their own lives. Absolutely. Nobody else should tell you how to live, what kind of project should be part of your life, who you want to be. Absolutely not. What they don't understand, however, is that for liberal ends, you need socialist means. Because if you don't have access to housing, food, healthcare, energy, if you're freezing cold in your house, you can't think about reading the complete works of Proust, right? You can't say, oh, you know what, I'm going to watch all those Goddard films down the cinema when you go to the ATM and it says £200 overdrawn. So I think it's fundamentally important to say that if you want these higher goods in life, then clearly you need to remove certain sources of, of deprivation. So... Like I say, liberal ends, impossible, that socialist means. And where, and I would put Matthew in the liberal tradition, I don't think that he would, he would disagree with that, I hope not. Where I think liberals get things badly wrong is they say individuals are uniquely placed to determine their lives, yes. And by the way, we're going to do economic distribution purely through markets. Well, that therefore means that individuals don't have access to the goods to be the people they want to be. Clearly, you need a measure of socialism. Clearly. And all the things you're talking about, inequality falling, well, actually... For the first 40, 50 years of the Industrial Revolution, living standards don't increase, even though we do have an extraordinary increase in productivity and, and innovation. Absolutely. They only start to increase when you get worker organizing, collective action, people asking for more money. And I find it incredible that basically your argument is, well, we got rid of child slavery laws, we got the eight-hour day, we got the, we got the weekend, we've got a socialized healthcare, and it's all thanks to the bosses. I mean, nobody thinks that. Not even the bosses think that. So all the progress, yes, there's been a great deal of progress that's been created by markets, technological innovation. Absolutely, of course there has. I like markets. I like technological innovation. Much of it, by the way, funded by the US taxpayer, which is referring to. But at the same time, those, those, those contractions in inequality and those improvements in, in, in living standards for all of us are because people fought for them.